Over the last year, NFTs came to prominence mainly as a means of applying artificial scarcity and value to digital assets and facilitating a highly speculative market of digital art objects and collectibles. Now that the bubble has burst, many questions arise about the whole techno-social infrastructure and the artistic practices emerging from it. These include, is speculation somehow intrinsic to the NFT environment? Is it possible to use blockchains as a means of authentication and to creatively experiment with smart contracts without indulging in the speculative behaviors typically associated with crypto? How can art and artists have a role in criticizing and reshaping the Web3 scenario? Which creative tactics and practices that have already been introduced carry, the more, carry more future potential? What can we learn from early net art and the way it responded to the increasing commercialization of the internet commons? And can NFTs be used to build communities? And to tackle these questions, we're joined for the final panel by Michel Kasperzak, a contributor to the field of digital cultures, urban commons, and social innovation. She has curated exhibitions and public programs for Future Flux Festival, V2, Institute for Unstable Media, the Dutch Electronic Art Festival, and others. Her writing has appeared in Hollow, Volume, Public, Spacing, Rhizome, and numerous exhibition catalogues. Currently, Michelle is postdoctoral researcher in Rotterdam and guest curator for the 2023 edition of the Norderlicht International Photo Festival. Maria Paula Fernandez has been working in Web3 since 2017, when she joined the Web3 Foundation as employee number three. In 2018, she founded a grassroots organization in Berlin, Department of Decentralization, hosting Web3 hackathons and researching, publishing, and curating at the intersection of art and technology. In early 2021, she started a company with Sam Spike and Trent Elmore called JPEG Space, which functions as a protocol that focuses on on-chain NFT curation. Vuk Trosic is a contemporary artist and pioneer of the net art movement. He's active in the fields of literature, politics, media archaeology, and network arts. One of Vuk's most recent works is Deep Asti, an NFT collection, conversion of his 1998 work of the same title, which depicts a scene from the pornographic film Deep Throat, rendered in Asti. And we would be remiss if we didn't mention uh, his exhibition, Na Nation Culture, which is currently on display in the Museum of Contemporary Art, Metelkova. And next up, we have Cornelia Solfrank, an artist and researcher living in Berlin. And as a pioneer of net art, Cornelia built up a reputation with two central projects, the Net Art Generator and Female Extension. Her publications include The Beautiful Warriors, Techno-Feminist Practice in the 21st Century, and Aesthetics of the Commons, while her latest contributions, co-authored with Winnie Soon, appeared in Fix My Code and Com The Computer as Seen at the End of the Human Age. Currently, she works as a research associate at the Zurich University of the Arts on the projects Creating Commons and performing the ambiguity of data. And finally, we welcome moderator Domenico Quaranta, an art critic, curator, and educator interested in the ways art reflects the current technological shift. He is the author, among other things, of Beyond New Media Art and Surfing with Satoshi, Art, Blockchain, and NFTs, and is editor of several books, including Game Scenes, Art in the Age of Video Games. Since 2005, he has curated numerous exhibitions, his two most recent being Hyperemployment and the Byzantine General's Problem. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Rock, for this introduction. I'm uh, happy and honored to have been invited to moderate uh, this uh, conversation and to do it uh, now, in this very moment in time, because I think uh, it can turn out uh, to be much more interesting than uh, the conversations uh, that happened uh, along the bubble. Uh, I'm not used to uh, read at uh, uh, conferences, but today I'm doing it uh, out of necessity because it's the only way for me to stay within uh, this uh, short uh, uh, time frame. So, <clears throat> in uh, uh, October 2002, Bloomberg Business Week uh, published a cover-to-cover -cover issue on crypto. Uh, written by financial journalist Matt Levine. At some point, Levine writes, um, in a sense, uh, it's a dumb time to be talking about crypto because the lines went down. But really, it's a good time to be talking about crypto. There is a pause. There is some repose. Uh, whatever is left uh, in crypto is not just speculation and get-rich-quick uh, schemes. Uh, we can think about what crypto means, uh, divorced uh, a little bit uh, from the lines going up. Uh, I agree with uh, Levine about crypto, and I think we can say the same thing about NFTs. Uh, the NFT bubble made it almost uh, impossible to talk about art without talking about the money. Crazy financial speculation dominated everything. Attention was measured in crypto. Artists were interesting only if they made the life-changing money. Here you can recognize, some of you may recognize Fewatchus, who is one of those uh, of many people who actually said that crypto changed their life. Uh, and it actually did, uh, from some points of view. Artworks uh, were interesting uh, only if they were sold for millions. Uh, DAOs uh, were celebrated uh, when they were able to raise uh, huge amounts uh, of money. Splits uh, with institutions uh, and benefit auctions uh, made the news uh, for the same reason. And NFTs uh, were interesting only if they allowed uh, all these things. In most of the cases, uh, all this collecting and investing was driven not by a level of art, a wish to support a cause, an idea, an underprivileged minority, but by speculation, investment bots, and by an active effort to promote uh, uh, crypto. Uh, I often quote this uh, uh, short sentence by Colbert Bell, uh, collector and founder of the Museum of Crypto Art, who said, uh, crypto art is the visual, visual language for the crypto financial revolution and how we display and disseminate and share this culture uh, that we have uh, is how we will spread the cryptocurrency mass adoption, um, which I think will create a fair economic system for everybody. If nothing else, now we can look at the art without thinking about the money in the first place. The artists and artworks' uh, interest in, technology, in the technology uh, was not so much affected by the falling lines. Uh, maybe we can say, as uh, Oliver Sheldone did on Super Rare magazine, um, that art doesn't play by the same economic rules as other assets, because art will always have value beyond the monetary. Some great uh, art projects uh, exploring uh, NFTs uh, launched uh, along this crypto winter. Uh, among the uh, others, uh, think about uh, this uh, dead clock, uh, generating soul-bound uh, NFTs uh, not meant to be flipped, uh, but meant to possibly be owned forever. Uh, Ian Chang's uh, Free Face, um, uh, an adaptive art artwork uh, uh, based on the collector's uh, wallet data and personality type. Uh, and Agnieszka Curant uh, uh, Sentimentite, uh, a fictional material shaped by harvested data uh, related to changes in 21st cent uh, century society. Um, all these projects came uh, out uh, and uh, maybe for the first time uh, the conversation uh, was mostly focused on their uh, contents uh, uh, than on their market uh, success, uh, how many people uh, bought uh, uh, this NFT, um, how much it costs uh, to redeem uh, the sculpture in uh, um, the work of Courant and so on and so forth. Museums, uh, institutions and galleries uh, keep being interested in NFTs uh, as an art form. Uh, 
uh, we can think about MoMA's uh, upcoming uh, uh, collaboration with Refik uh, Anadol, now in the news, uh, but also we can think about uh, uh, the Buffalo Art Museum upcoming uh, group exhibition peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, which is curated by Tina Rivers uh, Ryan and done in collaboration with the, uh, the platform Feral File. And we can also think about the Guggenheim and the Whitney's uh, investments uh, on digital uh, uh, curating, uh, which uh, um, uh, grew up uh, in the uh, latest uh, months uh, and years. Uh, and institutions and companies uh, caring for artists' rights uh, are launching their blockchain-based projects uh, as well. Uh, we can think about uh, Ars uh, NL, uh, the market platform set up by the American uh, Artist Rights Society and launched uh, with a work by Frank uh, Stella. Um, or about uh, Arqual, uh, which has, has been uh, co-founded by uh, Art Basel and the Luma Foundation to allow artists uh, to profit uh, from uh, uh, secondary sales. Uh, in the abstract that we prepared for this conversation that uh, Rock uh, uh, read, um, we raised a number of questions. Uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, using blockchains as a, mean of, uh, uh, as a means of authentication and experimenting with smart contracts without indulging in speculative behaviors is possible. Uh, some of the artistic examples uh, above uh, and a number of uh, uh, existing platforms uh, from feral file to object uh, show that uh, NFTs uh, keep being used to establish peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchanges uh, and gift uh, economies, not just in the expectation of life-changing money. Artworks have been, been made, uh, some of them uh, included in my exhibition, The Byzantine General's Problem, uh, which has been uh, produced uh, by Axioma. Uh, that question speculation uh, raised uh, issues of centralization and uh, sustainability, revealed the fallacy of some uh, of the promises of the crypto economy, involved collectors uh, in a, a different uh, long-term uh, relationship uh, with the artwork. I strongly believe that uh, artists, uh, by making artworks, uh, joining discussions, uh, educating people, uh, supporting uh, platforms uh, that prove uh, uh, to be more uh, aligned with their ideas, and connected, uh, connecting uh, with the part uh, of the cryptosphere which is more engaged uh, with the emancipatory politics, uh, like uh, Gerald Mill, for example, uh, can have a role in building uh, communities, uh, uh, sculpting the network, uh, as uh, artist Yang Cheng uh, said, and affecting, uh, if not uh, determining, uh, the ways uh, uh, this environment will evolve uh, in the future. I'm more skeptical about the possibility of uh, removing uh, speculation from this uh, environment uh, altogether, at least uh, in the current scenario. Even if currency, as artist Kevin McNo McCoy and tech entrepreneur Enil Dash said uh, in 2014, um, is the less interesting thing uh, uh, you could uh, uh, build with this technology. It's also true that uh, uh, monetization seems um, uh, somehow embedded in the blockchain environment. The first blo blockchain came about to mine and circulate a currency. The economic incentive is instrumental in persuading network nodes to participate in securing the database. NFTs were conceived to demonstrate value and provenance, and smart contracts are designed to automate transactions. A project like uh, uh, Merge by Murak Pak, uh, launched in December 2021, uh, is uh, to me a bitter reminder of what an NFT project is uh, when you are able to look beyond the surface. The art may be anything like uh, a dot in this uh, uh, case, um, and be sold for whatever reason, but in the end it's a representation of its own value, bought and sold to a mass more value. Uh, the community might include art lovers, dreamers and activists with a political agenda, but in its basic form it's a pool of investors linked by economic transactions and bound together by self-interest. Uh, whose ultimate destiny is to merge into one. Um, American critic Brian Droitkur recently wrote uh, on Outland, the, those who seek an alternative art world should find some encouragement in NFT art. 
it is possible to build something else that uh, uh, sustains itself, um, even if it's uh, disheartening that financialization is probably necessary to do so in a capitalist world. Uh, maybe we should uh, uh, think about the conclusion of this uh, uh, sentence uh, and uh, uh, agree when, uh, with uh, uh, Yanis Varoufakis when he says uh, that only in a, in a post capitalist world uh, um, we can expect the blockchains and the NFTs uh, to deliver their full potential. Uh, but I leave this uh, uh, both as a um, statement and a question uh, that hopefully we'll uh, uh, have the chance to discuss uh, afterwards. And now, uh, without uh, uh, further ado, uh, let me invite uh, on stage uh, uh, Michelle for her presentation. Thank you very much. Recently, in London, a startup called MyNFT installed a bright purple vending machine, selling NFTs for 10 quid a pop. Well, sort of. They were selling QR codes that you could buy with Apple Pay or contactless, and then you could take the QR code home and use the MyNFT platform to access your multi-chain NFT without needing to set up a crypto wallet or think about what chain you prefer to use. Positioning it as a way of removing barriers, Hugh McDonough, the founder of my NFT, said, quote, There is so much potential in the NFT market, and it's such a shame to see that some of it goes to waste when possible investors are put off getting involved by unnecessary and complicated barriers. So we're determined to turn NFT investment into an everyday activity and break it out of its current click. End quote. I'm going to get back to this, but first, let's look at the vending machine itself as a thing, a metaphor, an icon. Coin-operated machines dispensing items for sale have existed since ancient Egypt, when Heron of Alexandria devised a machine that dispensed holy water when a coin was inserted. In the early 1800s, coin-operated machines in London dispensed postcards. Vending machines became a global business dispensing bottled water, stamps, Twinkies, sex toys, calling cards, freshly baked baguettes, USB cables, pizza, and now NFTs, sort of. By the side of the road, at the end of a long corridor, stuffed in basements or at the ends of train platforms, squeezed into the corners of shopping malls and airports and hotel lobbies. When you're far from home, when you're unprepared, when you're hungry or thirsty and a bit desperate and willing to shovel in four euros worth of coins for a bottle of filtered tap water, the vending machine is there. The vending machine is there, glowing and rattling in the corner, filled with nice cold Coca-Cola. They're available 24-7, they're there when everything else is closed. Heron's holy water dispenser was to ensure that people didn't take too much in one go. Today's vending machines are about there being no such thing as too much. They ensure that we take what we want, when we want. The My NFT vending machine is a lousy concept that was slated in the press. NFT vending machine gets frosty reception, sneered one headline. The concept applies poorly to NFTs, which are ownership certificates for pieces of digital art. They're ways for you to show solidarity and support digital artists by buying ownership certificates of their work. They inscribe evidence of your support in the blockchain, making them much more like a museum's donor board than like a vending machine, which accepts your anonymously inserted coin and spits out junk food. The frictionlessness of our everyday transactions, contactless payments for food wrapped in plastic that we'd never have any idea how to grow on our own anymore, has cut us off from the inherent value and energy which has gone into the creation of each thing that we consume. The NFT vending machine denies something crucial about getting into the NFT scene as a creator. The barriers that the NFT vending machine intend to sweep away are actually very useful. A friction that reminds us of the cost of each computational transaction. The gas fees for every tiny change that we make to the blockchain, a reminder that while it feels frictionless and virtual, the digital is very much rooted in the physical uses of energy and that data storage takes vast infrastructures to be realized. Some 20 odd years ago, digital art was the ugly child of the art world. 
No one knew how to sell it, preserve it, what on earth to do with it. That made it a free space to create, being outside the pressure of selling something that would fit well in a prestige collection. I want to quote from an essay that Matthew Fuller wrote for an online exhibition I co-curated with Michael Alstad, a net art show called Pixel Plunder. This was in 2001. Fuller says, quote, is talent important in net art? This group of works gives us the answer. Let us remember that the name talent was that of an ancient coin. What is a coin but a condensed power to take something out? The possibility to move a thing, an action, a power, from one state into another, to magnify, to set into motion, to store up or to kill, to set something aside, to make it separate. Scarcity of talent is what allows net artwork to be seen in two ways. Firstly, each piece of work is not especially apart from the other works by the artists or groups that produced it. It is part of a practice. Secondly, each work is assembled out of parts that belong to a collectively available resource. So this again is something set aside from the standard issue art modes, unique visitors, talented individuals, and all the rest of it. It's the power to connect. Here, no talent delivers the goods." End quote. What he's describing was a scene without many real stars by the mainstream art world standards in a text for an exhibition about appropriation and anti-copyright. No talent wasn't a diss. It was stating that the group of net artists working then were all part of a scene together, creating something in exchange with each other. It was operating outside the market, it was breaking rules, and it was exploring territory that could be expressed in the bounds of the browser, the director projector, the flash intro. There was little money then. Finally, now digital art has found its monetization hook. It's true that this monetization can flatten and distort and encourage bad actors. It encourages blockbuster thinking. But also clearly what we caught a glimpse of in those early heady days of the Hicketnunk platform, for example, was the potential for an immense, immense amount of crap to be created, yes, but also for the earnest, the good, the beautiful, and for an urgent kind of mutual aid to emerge. In his essay, Not Another JPEG, artist Matthew Plummer Fernandez describes a scene that feels a lot like those net art early days. He talks of Hicketnunk as, quote, a platform with integrity and purpose rather than the glamour and exclusivity. And he further notes that we shouldn't overlook the importance of finding new sources of income for minorities and people in the pandemic hit Global South, as it's easy to dismiss NFTs as an extraneous pastime for the already crypto rich, end quote. So we have the vending machine on one side, providing the junk food of the system, a frictionless interaction where you don't have to understand a thing about what you're engaging in, and the potluck dinner on the other, providing a friction-full place where you have to engage with all aspects of bringing your wares to swap and share. The creator of the My NFT vending machine referred to investors. Plumber Fernandez speaks in his essay of artists. This is a critical difference in perspective. Critics of NFTs and the blockchain have pointed out many flaws. The ecological cost, the recreation of a star system with blockbuster auction sales and exclusive drops. Digital artists have always had to form communities and provide mutual support. And a few of them beginning to make money outside the strictures of grant schemes is a healthy development. NFTs have become a lightning rod because we're measuring their impact and the highs and lows of the market are breathtaking. They're holding up a mirror to how we are, fortunately or unfortunately, entangled in the world as it is. And we have to navigate the everyday challenges of how to ethically earn money, how to ethically consume each and everything required to sustain us. It's hypocritical to hate on NFTs and then take your gas guzzling car on a road trip, but don't worry, we're not judging. You can only work together to make the whole system better, tiny piece by tiny piece. We live in a constantly changing, imperfect world and imperfect system. Capitalist, extractivist, prone to appointing stars and leaders rather than encouraging equity, fairness and harmony. We live in what Stephen Jackson called our almost always falling apart world. Noting the feats of repair that it takes to just keep any kind of system, technology or object continuing to function. Jackson says that in fact, quote, precisely in the moments of breakdown, it's that we then we learn to see and engage our technologies in new and sometimes surprising ways, end quote. Can we learn from the failures and repair the system, making it into something better? 
Can we avoid recreating the hierarchies of the wider art world and preserve spaces for experimentation, mutual aid, and a frictionful knowledge of the ecological cost of all our actions? I think we can. Vending machines can actually be useful. Useful metaphor, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are uh, uh, ready for uh, uh, Anna Paula presentation, so you can go on stage. Yeah. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I don't have an incredibly articulate essay for you. Um, as a matter of fact, really discouraged by the industry that I work in. Um, as Rock introduced me, I have been working in Web3 for six years now. I also own a company. Um, I started a nonprofit organization to educate people about crypto. And this past week, all my beliefs have been disappointed. And a lot of the things that I'm building are actually endangered because some kids in Bahamas decided to play big money games. And this is very discouraging to me because it, uh, everything is so intertwined right now. It affects legislation because they were in cahoots with the SEC. It affects, of course, the market, but the market bounces back. That's totally fine. I've seen it before. We will recover. And it also discourages people. So, you know, I was supposed to bring a little bit of uh, optimism here. Um, I can't in good mind do that. Um, instead, I'm gonna show you things that we have been building that make me excited and I'm gonna, that I'm gonna also make me excited through the next months. And I hope they also make you excited and you are here with me, wishing that they make it through the hard times. Um, how do I skip? Okay, okay. Um, so the first one is the sphere. Um, the sphere is a community that started within the circus uh, uh, scene uh, in, the, uh, in, in the culture uh, ecosystem. And the Sphere has been looking for many years now how to fund their community in a sustainable way through cryptocurrencies. Uh, as you may know, uh, of course, uh, because this is a very literate uh, audience, um, the performance scene, and especially circuses, um, are not really well funded. It's very hard to fund uh, performance as it is as well in, t uh, in the museums. So they came up with a very interesting scheme where you would be definitely buying an NFT, but you would be buying an NFT, not that shows a cute photo of a monkey. Uh, you would be buying an NFT that signifies that you would be investing in the long-term production of uh, this uh, group of performance, performance, which I find incredibly interesting. So this is a, a proof that NFTs and crypto can serve to fund things that were very hard to be fund, things that people think they have no value as well, because uh, you know people tend to think that a performance is not the same as an you know, as a painting, for example. And as a matter of fact, a performance is not valued the same as a painting. And this is a traditional art world, you know. It's, this is not about the finances of NFTs. This is a problem that existed long ago. Um, so yeah, just look it up. Yeah, you know, I'm here just to amplify these voices. Um, then there's this project that uh, I helped build uh, with artist Hito Steyer. We took over the ENS domain. The ENS is like the uh, DNS, but for Ethereum. We took over the ENS domain for uh, the Bundeskunsthalle uh, the, in Bonn. Uh, and then we decided to tell them to propose different governance alternatives and that we would propose the, uh, our own as well. So basically what we did was a, a performance. Um, and we staged the performance in a, in the context of understanding that the Bundeskunsthalle 
even if it was squatted, it also had agency. So during this performance, uh, there were three groups presenting different governance uh, alternatives. One was uh, the president of the Bundeskunsthalle. Uh, one was the Department of Decentralization, the nonprofit organization that I've started, uh, where we presented a, a different governance uh, structure on which we really thought of the real stakeholders of the Bundeskunsthalle. And who are those people? The taxpayers. So what we were seeking to do is to prove to the Bundeskunsthalle that even uh, that everyone uh, from the outside audience to the people doing the cleaning uh, at the Bundeskunsthalle that don't have a voice in the, um, in the program deserve a voice in the program because they were funding. So uh, yeah, this ended up in you know, a very speculative proposal that uh, hopefully makes the Bundeskunsthalle question how, uh, you know, how to approach uh, their program in, ter in the term of you know, everyone is a stakeholder. And uh, we submitted the proposal, so this is uh, how a proposal would go, and we submitted the proposal to a vote in uh, the performance, and look like, looks like uh, ours won. Um, so I'm still waiting to hear from the Bundeskunsthalle. This has been in April. Um, if you find them, then just send them my way. You know, I need my trophy. And then I'm going to talk to you about Web3 native uh, cultural infrastructure. As every other, uh, as all the panelists have presented, um, NFTs, uh, the, the NFT bubble has effectively burst and people are reassessing their assumptions. The crypto bubble has also burst, and people are again reassessing uh, what they believe, uh, what alternative, what uh, infrastructure did they choose to handle their finances. The same uh, happens uh, with NFTs. NFTs are the cultural objects of Web3, and therefore we must uh, have a supporting cultural infrastructure that uh, is able to take them to you know the same gravitas as the cultural objects of the real world have. As a matter of fact, uh, right now, and like you said, uh, MoMA is trying out with NFTs, but they're trying out with an NFT that actually is nothing like the like the canon that MoMA is collecting. It doesn't challenge any kind of thought, uh, any kind of notion. It doesn't provoke. It's just beautiful to look at. It's interesting because it has an aggregation of data, but it's nothing like the conceptual art or the canon that MoMA was building. So my assumption here is that the that uh, MoMA, that uh, is that MoMA actually thinks that NFTs already have enough controversy of their own. So anything that you should be looking at in terms of NFTs should be pretty and unproblematic. And you know, if yeah, if MoMA is going to say that, then we're going to build our own infrastructure. This is what Web, Web3, what Web3 does. Um, here are some examples of the Web3 native cultural infrastructure that I mean. And then I'm going to explain you what, what, what does this mean. Um, you know, Web3 uh, native cultural infrastructure can, uh, can or should be decentralized. It should be permissionless as well. Um, it should be trustworthy. Uh, I'm not talking anything in, anymore about trustless because trustless has negative connotations. I believe more in trustworthy systems that can support our interactions between humans. Um, one of these is Zora, that is also a hyperstructure, which I'm going to mention very sh shortly. Zora is a permissionless and a decentralized marketplace, the first of its kind. Art Gobblers is a decentralized uh, art factory that's able, that has created a scheme on which the creatives that are feeding the monsters that our gobblers is creating, um, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, I have two minutes, um, get a cut. Uh, then we have art blocks, uh, then we have MoCA, the Museum of uh, Crypto Art. Uh, we have Black Swan DAO as well, a DAO to administrate uh, resources, uh, artist resources, and JPEG, which is the curation uh, protocol that I'm building. Um, what is decentralized uh, cultural infrastructure? It's decentralized, permissionless, trustworthy systems. It's open source. Uh, it's credibly neutral when applicable, uh, and it's po it's positive sum, and it's free, free as in be freedom, not as in beer. So, obviously, uh, you know, like the there is a 
a next step in uh, Web3 native cultural infrastructure, which are hyperstructures, which are a little bit more technical and are supposed to run entirely on chain. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not very achievable. You know, it's not very realistic because it takes a lot of dev lift and de developers are very scarce. So we build what we can uh, with the best uh, characteristics of Web3 in mind. Um, JPEG is a curation protocol. It aims to help order the NFT world via crowdsourced lists and uh, that basically will allow for new primitives to arise uh, where uh, the, uh, the cultural value enters the conversation uh, in the same at uh, uh, par with the financial value. Um, it's tied to a reputation system to gamify the whole thing because you can't expect, expect people to do the librarian work without having fun, at least, uh, if not getting paid. But getting paid, uh, you know, messes things up in this realm, so we're going to skip it for now. And we are about to launch it, so we hope that people like it. My name is Vuk and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah here we are. <laughs> so uh, this, this panel has a question as a title. And uh, Domenico, could you remind me, something, is uh, NFT post bubble uh, long term something? Uh, so I made, uh, I made this slide deck um, first with only one slide. And it had just this very big word, no. Uh, but then I decided to honor the format of 10 minutes of me presenting, and I would not have much to say o o over a no. Um, so I decided to elaborate briefly. And when we had a small Zoom session to kind of make a deal, how are we gonna do this? Uh, I remembered when we were discussing the uh, aroma, the, the emotions surrounding um, an artist's partic possible participation in NFT space. Uh, I, I, I thought of this fantastic uh, thing, which has something to do with this car. Um, that's, uh, that explains a car, and I will go on. Uh, but before this, uh, I, I want to state a position, maybe. I, I'm, what, 50-something, 50 56 years old. I'm, I'm this old-school new media artist. Uh, uh, I'm like, uh, I'm from a punk generation in my life when I was a kid, when I was entering life in the art world, uh, there were these terrible um, older people with uh, greasy hair uh, carrying Pink Floyd records and telling me that this punk stuff that we're into and you know, new wavy shit and experimentation, it's all crap, you should listen to this, look at, listen to this solo. And so now I'm this uh, hippie with uh, greasy hair, I wish. <laughs> uh, uh, telling kids what to do and not to do and listen and not to listen. So I'm aware that this is a tricky thing. I'm this senior citizen in a children's birthday party cracking dad jokes and I apologize in many ways right away. Uh, but this, you know, being Jimi Hendrix that failed to overdose still gives me a little bit of uh, credit to try and add a little couple of pixels to your thinking process and I'm trying to think of an empathy exercise. Uh, what's it like to be a relatively young person entering the world uh, hoping to create meaning, uh, to contribute art and then bumping into fucking NFT, you know. So when we were talking about this panel, uh, I remember this amazing thing that this non-governmental organization, Rolls-Royce, uh, that makes cars, uh, came up with this uh, uh, Phantom, is a model you saw in the previous slide, and one half of the dashboard is uh, not only designed, but it, it is named a gallery, so they call it, this is a Phantom gallery, and I really loved that. Um, and to me, you know, working with NFT is exactly like decorating rich people's dashboards in their very, very expensive cars. Um, I contacted the NGO in question, uh, hoping to actually create an art piece 
for their platform and then presenting it here. Sadly, they, I got just a robotic reply. Thank you very much for your inquiry. A specialist will assist you and blah, blah, blah. Never materialized. So this is a plan B. Um, these, these, these creations are just amazing and you can, you can kind of imagine. Uh, and this is where art goes to die, right? Uh, and this is just a tangent here, but I just, as an artist, I look at these things and, and the, those free ports, you know those? Uh, Hito wrote about it a lot, yeah, your partner. Uh, yeah. Uh, my Hito, the, the partner uh, yeah, yeah. you did a project with, I know, I know. No, Hito's partner is Boris, right, from Zagreb. Uh, anyway, uh, as an artist, you're interested in, uh, yes, creating or uh, ascribing uh, meaning to stuff, but you're also interested in the uh, life and the afterlife of what you have done. And I believe uh, ending up in a collection that's not accessible is like the worst that can happen to you, however glamorous it sounds and however rolls royce it is. And I wanted to just add this into consideration. Remember, this is just my attempt to add a few uh, ratio active elements into your thinking process if you are a young artist and you're not. Uh, I had a... Um, I had a talk with some uh, foreigners <laughs> recently for some magazine, um, and they were asking me uh, about my feeling uh, about generations from net art on uh, to NFT. And I, I provided this little metaphor. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an artist. We, we take things literally all the time, so I need simplicity. So um, I said, look, as as early net artists, you know, 94 or 5, Shuli is here, hello Shuli, don't read your telephone, listen to my talk. Yeah, come on. Um, we were more like, you know, street artists. We believed in artist-run initiatives. Uh, we had no political economy, even though this is an impossible statement, of course. And we were into revolution. And then a few years later, uh, the first bubble burst anyway, and then there was this thing called post-internet art, you might remember, like mid-2000s. To, mid and they were cool, passionate, or like uh, Matt Fuller said, uh, with talent as well. Um, I, I met some of these people, and they're great, I love their work. But you see, uh, their work was not about escaping the art world or the art system or the money. They liked it very much. So uh, for this magazine in Miami, I made a comparison. That I said that my generation was more like Sex Pistols, and this generation was like Duran Duran. I, I think it was like the most insulting thing I could come up with, but I liked it. Uh, and, and then, if I'm about to, you know, anyway, I have the microphone, so you can't stop me. So if I'm going to make, uh, milk the metaphor further, I, I want to insist that uh, it's um, the, the way I perceive the art, uh, uh, um, the artistic drama of working with NFT is like working with, not even in a boy band, but with autotune. It's like entirely devoid of anything inspirational for me. Because you see, um, you might rem remember that uh, um, musician that does graffiti nowadays, uh, Banksy, who had this documentary about his work, uh, uh, Exit Through the Museum Store, and that was already quite a um, sharp critique of, let's say, the capitalist circumstances. But, but I think that now we have uh, an even worse situation that in order to participate, we have to enter through the wallet. And I, I find this like a next floor of that same already fatal phrase. So I thought I should share it with you. It's, uh, it's me talking over my sound bites. And um, this is like a little conclusion I had. Uh, and I, I think I have the, you know, um, the right to pronounce such things. Mm. Really, uh, for me, NFT is reality net art. It's like reality TV in that sense. Somebody used already that expression here, I think. I heard someone before. Um, people are just going through the motions, using the same rhetorical refreshments and uh, you know, the, the same phrasing as if uh, we had something emancipatory going on, as if we had some new opportunities happening to, for anybody. And we don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's as if uh, we would ask the question for our panel, is Second Life a viable long-term anything? And then, of course, again, the answer is yes, uh, if you are a media archaeologist, but otherwise, no. Uh, and then, 
uh, just like somebody, I believe, in one of the questions earlier uh, mentioned that with every media technology, there's a new generation of artists asking hard questions and trying to play with a toy. Uh, uh, I just remembered something that I like to share with younger artists because I see that they have no problem complying with stuff around them, and for me that is taboo. And, and that's this little piece of advice. Whenever you meet technology, first thing you need to do is to burn that fucking manual because that is the only path for, to possibly create something of meaning. Otherwise, you start be belonging. Oh, that word. You start participating. You become a testimonial to somebody else's hardware, software, infrastructure, agenda, wallet, or something else. And that's like quite bad. And, and now, a very special effect uh, on this stage. Uh, I'm going to be shocking Marcella, my friend, who is showing me the two-minute sign, and I'll, I'll, I'll move to my last slide, which means I'm going to be done before my slot. There you go. So I, I expect that you are shocked. So thank you, guys. I'll be here. Thank you, Vuk, for uh, reminding us that where uh, uh, Arte goes to die. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, um, Cornelia, can you hear us? Okay, it's time for, uh, for you to deliver your presentation. My old friends, I could see in Ljubljana. Um, very nice to see you. Um, thanks to all the wonderful and wonderfully efficient people who put this event together and also made this book become real. And also, of course, thanks for inviting me to the panel today. When I was thinking about my contribution, it became clear to me once again that I'm re representing the old generation. Vuk already talked about this, the generation of the pioneers of internet art. They have started to call us OGs, which is also why I called my first set of NFTs OG flowers. The abbreviation OG stands for the English expression original gangster and refers to someone who is old school, which means authentic, and has still experienced the old days. In our context, this would be the early days of World Wide Web which started to explore and conceptualize as an artistic medium. This came with the rhetoric of institutional critique, of decentralization, of self-organization, a critique of the traditional art market, and its fetishization of originality, uniqueness, and individual authorship. And it was not just a rhetoric. For many, it was an attitude that was genuine and inspired by the then new possibilities of the digital networked medium. For today's panel, I thought it might be interesting as a point of crystallization, so to say, to compare and discuss the parameters of both the net-based art, net art of the 90s and the one of today. Maybe this will take us a bit closer to some answers, at least. This comparison already implies a first statement from my side. Art NFTs do not constitute a new genre, but can certainly be subsumed under the term net-based art. In short, it is a genre that is not just digital art or media art. What is specific is that the internet is an essential component of the work, which of course can manifest itself in many ways. We are often addressed as predecessors of today's hype around digital art, while almost none of the OGs plays a significant role in this scene. We should speculate a bit later why this is the case. Now I would like to speak a bit about the perimeters of the net-based artworks and art worlds. By and large, they are digital in nature, which means they can be copied without loss of quality, and usually they are available online in their natural habitat. All copies of digital works are equally original. This simple fact is the reason why the, the, the traditional art market never was able to warm up to this genre. All attempts to make limited editions of websites or carve them in stone remained ridiculous and fruitless. 
Another problem with digital artworks, especially net-based ones, is their preservation. Michelle already mentioned it. Without skilled personnel and appropriate resources, it's almost impossible to preserve these works for decades. This makes them uninteresting for collectors, especially those who intend to speculate with the works in their collection. Which takes me to my second statement. Digital art and network-based art in particular is unsuitable for collecting. That there are people who are collecting and preserving these works nonetheless is a different story, be it institutions, museums, or private collections. It requires special care and expertise to deal with these objects, and the people who do are heroes, in my opinion. The recent market success of art NFTs shows, however, that there has been a shift. The works themselves are still digital, sometimes code-based and networked. However, the difference is that they come with a certificate that guarantees its uniqueness. My statement three is that with art NFTs, a new art market was created. The new kind of commodity has spawned a whole new culture based on a new form of trading digital assets. The abbreviation stands for non-gible tokens, which means certificates of ownership stored on the blockchain. NFTs have existed for a few years, but as a cultural phenomenon, they have only received broad media attention following the sales of NFTs for artworks for which many millions were paid. All of a sudden, digital art was associated with market success. Considerable new money was flowing into this market, which in fact has triggered the production of a flood of new digital works. I still maintain my assertion that this is not a new genre. On the contrary, we are mainly talking about image production and the aesthetics and aspirations behind the images were often amazingly banal. The traditional art world loved to make a fuss about the lack of artistic quality while gradually being forced to take this art seriously simply because staggering prices were paid for it. The most innovative aspect of this development was that the digital objects generated a thriving trade because they came with this digital certificate of ownership, the NFT. And trading has become easy. It only meant a few digital transactions. NFTs have no intrinsic value. When you buy an NFT, you don't acquire the copyright to the image. You can't sue someone for using the image placed on the NFT. You can't stop others from replicating it. You can't actually do anything with it. The actual image hosted at the URL could be copied or the file corrupted or the URL's domain could go bankrupt or the artist could create another NFT of the same image and sell it, sell it as an NFT. Or I could sell an NFT of an image that someone else created. To quote Felix Stalder in the introduction of our series from Comments to NFTs, the key properties of such mainly digital objects are their scarcity, the social status provided by their ownership, and the ability to trade them in specialized markets. This new market created by digital certificates of ownership has not existed for early net-based art. The main characteristic of digital art is that there is no original and it is in infinitely reproducible. NFTs offer a workaround for the abundance inherent in digital art in favor of its marketability, thus fulfilling the paradoxical desire of the market for originality. The question for us OGs was whether we wanted to become part of the gold rush if we wanted to buy into the manufacturing of digital scarcity and increase the monetary value of our works if we wanted our early works make purchasable through NFTs or even produce new works according to the new aesthetics. I decided to run an experiment by feeding 100 anonymous Warhol flowers into the system. Produced by a generative software, 
Factories net are generated. These images have proven their ability to connect again and again to ever new discourses and thus to constantly update themselves. And here comes a little quote from the press release. Therefore, it is no surprise that they finally do the honors to appear in the semiotic carnival of crypto art, having their origin in the unoriginal genius of a machine. Their NFTs create the aura that has been missing, the aura of the digital copy. And while their author elegantly remained in the gray area of copyright, a new social fiction grants certainty, ownership of an original. The collectors didn't mind that. In legal terms, I have no rights to the images that these network images rather demonstrated the absurdity of copyright altogether and paid the price of 0.25 ether to become owners of an URL of such an image. The test was successful in the sense that almost half of the images got sold while these transactions revealed the total absurdity of this market. In the beginning, I talked about the spirit that informed early net-based art, namely institutional critique a critique of the traditional art market and its fetishization of originality. The utopia of a decentralized and more democratic art world, all of this was based on the specificities of the digital network medium. We thought that the change would come more or less automatically with the pervasiveness of the technology. We were proven wrong. Hierarchization and centralization structured the internet along commercial interests. This is where we are now, and also blockchain technology also comes with a lot of this rhetoric. I'm skeptical that the new generation will be able to achieve the transformation they are talking about. Also, in some niches, innovations might be possible. Artistic innovation has taken place all along technical innovations. Sadly enough, they are only considered relevant when market forces style them to be, be it the crypto market or the traditional art market. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cornelia. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, uh, about half an hour for conversation and uh, uh, questions from uh, the audience. Uh, I will uh, uh, open up in 10 minutes uh, the conversation to the audience, both in this uh, uh, room uh, and also from uh, uh, the internet. If anybody wants uh, to send uh, uh, questions, I will be able to uh, read them on the screen and uh, uh, share it uh, with the audience uh, in this room. Uh, but mm, I, I have a quite an uh, uh, urgent uh, question for the original gangsters. Um, because, um, um, uh, of course, I've been uh, very vocal about my criticism uh, uh, on NFTs and uh, blockchain and so on. But one thing uh, that uh, uh, was uh, quite interesting for me uh, to see uh, as a person who uh, grew up in the early Netarts uh, uh, days uh, was uh, to see... Um, uh, things that somehow were getting uh, uh, interesting and challenging and conflictual again, no? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, most uh, media art uh, uh, of the... Uh, 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 not the media art itself, but the community, the living in this community was uh, uh, quite depressing, quite uh, stale. We, uh, everybody adapted to this uh, social media uh, panopticon uh, and uh, accepted it uh, uh, with not so much uh, uh, conflict. No? And now what I can see in this environment are uh, people going back to uh, questions of uh, authorship uh, uh, and how um, to question it. Uh, 
like for example, uh, uh, Rider Rips uh, with uh, uh, CryptoPunks uh, and uh, uh, the board the Apes uh, is very uh, reminding to me uh, the um, uh, copy uh, and appropriation uh, uh, period of uh, net art and also uh, problematics like uh, the presence of a woman uh, in this environment has been uh, raised up uh, again and I'm thinking uh, to Cornelia and their family extension and so on. So mm, I, I don't agree with people uh, uh, saying uh, 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 I, I mean, uh, from net art to NFTs is maybe even more, more problematic than saying uh, from uh, uh, commons to NFT. But at the same time, uh, um, there is a vibe that reminds uh, of those uh, early years. I, I don't know if you feel uh, the same. And the question is for both, of course. No. Thank you. The answer is no. Uh, but yeah, uh, look. I, 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 one time I was talking to other people about similar shit and I, I used the word Brodello. You know, there was this French guy, uh, Fernand Brodel, he died. He was a historian. He came up with this idea, long durée, uh, which is an important concept in history. Um, and uh, the Brodello wallpaper is this like sinking feeling uh, among new media or media artists that we simply are redecorating every few years the same debate. Uh, and it is depressing. Um, and now, uh, Connie, uh, Cornelia used a, a very important word that was a very big expression back in the mid-90s, which was the media specificity. Uh, we were asking ourselves, oh, okay, you know, Cervantes uh, came after 150 years of printing press with a new media invention, which was a novel, and uh, since then everybody wrote novels, how cool. And now what is our medium specific uh, piece and net art was supposed to be uh, an attempt to answer that question among other questions. Um, here now, the specificity of, of approaching NFT is possible, it exists. As I said, I am this senior citizen hippie uh, interrupting the kids party and I'm aware I'm in like super slippery terrain. Uh, it's just that when I look at it, uh, there's tons I can understand easily, and I can see the self-hypnosis going on, the, the cult-like uh, belief in the rhetorical tricks, uh, stories of having the opportunity to do something for the first time, having the opportunity to create in new ways. I'm not noticing that this is happening. I see in your book, in other people's talks, uh, even before today, I mean, it's all great shit. I see some conceptually massively grown up, clever, mature approaches, but the best thing with those is that they are refusing NFTs. Uh, maybe because, you know, maybe it's just that we happen to congregate always in a similar kind of groups, and so it's easy to be self-congratulatory and everything. But the one word you used, I cannot find it in me to agree. Uh, you said there is a conflict, there is a contradiction. Uh, I'm not noticing any. There's either super compliance, let's get rich fast. Okay, that's like somewhere between 99.8 and 0.9% of the participants in the scene. Or uh, tough critique, trying to sort of show how this is all useless. I'm not seeing a conflict. There's no other side. Maybe that's what I'm not seeing. And the art system is just following like it always does. Cornelia, do you want to add something? Yes, I can add something. Um, I don't know as much as work. I'm not, I don't can say a clear no. I'm, as I said in the beginning and also in my text, I'm skeptical. Uh, I'm interested um, what people are doing. I love to have conversations with them. And maybe one thing um, I have to mention is that you probably know Furtherfield in London, an artist organization to promote digital network media starting in the 97, starting off with a critique of the art market and uh, continuing through until today. They are, meanwhile, a very thriving art institution. And 
my friend Ruth Cutler, who is one of the people who run it, she is now leading um, the crypto lab at Serpentine Gallery. And she's collaborating with Penny Rafferty, um, who created the Black Swan Lab with other people, of course, in Berlin, in collaboration with uh, Kunstwerke. Uh, Maria Paula mentioned this work with um, Okay, that's a different story. I come back to that later. But these two are for me, and I'm I'm trying to have conversations with Ruth on a regular basis, because as I said, I'm very skeptical, and I think my piece also demonstrated. You know, I engaged uh, uh, with NFTs and this uh, show like as a performative experiment, as an intervention to see what happens to make it more clear to me the workings of the system. Um, my biggest problem is that cryptocurrency plays such an important role. It's hard to escape from cryptocurrency, and that is something that is basically out of our control. And so all this talk about DAOs and self-organization and, and new ways of government, I, I find interesting because it is something that has always interested me, and there were very not very many, but there were some really important experiments in these fields, also from artists, like, for example, also Rhizome comes from this, uh, but also The Thing New York and others. So it was not all in vain, and it did not all fail, but that's why I said, I think that innovations in niches might be possible, but of course there's this larger framework within which we are operating. And when I look at the work of Ruth, for example, uh, with Turpentine and also with Penny, I wonder why these traditional art institutions, firstly, are interested in dealing with that, and secondly, what do we need them for? That, that keeps me really, I don't know. I don't know what is going on. And maybe we can discuss about it also with, uh, with Maria, because you are also more actively involved in this scene. And because when I think or talk about decentralization, I'm not thinking about, you know, I want to collaborate with uh, MoMA or Kunstwerke or Serpentine on something. It's the opposite. So what is their interest in, you know, putting money into this? And actually, I don't think also in terms of the Kunstwerke uh, Kunst project, that this will lead anywhere. I'm sorry today, but I don't think that the Kunsthalle will restructure and you probably never ever hear from them anymore. And so I wonder what is the point of this whole exercise, you know? And I think they only got attention, you know, they could associate themselves with some cool people and some new cool rhetoric. But um, I, I think, I tend to bet that uh, the institution will not change itself at all. So anyway, that was a bit all over the place, but uh, yeah. So I don't say a no, but I'm skeptical, you know, and I still look into things and talk to people. Um, I actually absolutely agree um, with what Cornelia said. You know, I know, I know that I'm being instrumentalized. Instrumentalized. Um, I know it's about a, you know, like a desperate a, attempt from institutions to reinvent themselves. I know it's also about the stakeholders of that institution to say we have to join the conversation, but let's do it in the most unproblematic w way possible. And let's do it only with the good actors, you know, because they're not gonna, it, MoMA is not gonna talk to me when they're thinking about, a, you know, starting their collection. There's, they're not gonna promote Zora as a marketplace because it's decentralized uh, permissionless and whatnot. Um, they're gonna talk to Feral File because that's what they know, because it's cases, because it's trusted, because it protects. And uh, decentralization is nothing about that. Decentralization is about agency. Um, I don't think that institutions are understanding. At the same time, I don't think we need institutions. As I said, we can build our own. Um, I do think there's exceptions to that rule. Um, Serpentine, uh, you know, sort of putting the blockchain love uh, in charge of Ruth 
and the experiments that they're doing by, uh, by creating the Future Art Ecosystem Report, uh, three years in a row. That's a quite legit uh, one, even if they, you know, if they have their own controversies and whatnot, but that feels genuine. Um, the Bundeskunsthalle coming to, uh, uh, to us and telling us, okay, you know, we're gonna do something blockchain. Uh, first of all, they came through Hito, who is a very respected figure, but they also invited us because, yeah, you know, we're the face of the future, um, if you want to call it that way. Um, to be honest, I agree with, you know, both the side that there is legitimate and incredible experimentation um, in Web3 and NFTs, and uh, there is a lot, there's not only a few examples, there's a lot, but they're drowned by, uh, and they're just crushed by the narratives of value that mainstream media only picks up. And this is also what ha was happening to MoMA. Um, so, yeah, of course, you know, how can you uh, find out about the experiments that are going on with all that noise, which is so annoying, with all those communities that are so dumb, as well. Um, I, I can't blame artists for, for thinking this way. I have, to, I have to add something. You know, you, re, you remember there's been this uh, same stuff uh, happening 30 years ago or how many. It's, um, <laughs> there is this sentence. Uh, I, I'm, I'm certain I came up with it and then I understand that Castell uh, stole it from me 30 years ago and I just came about, uh, whatever. The technology has a tendency to be the amplifier of the social relations, uh, the consolidator of the power structure. So technology is not in by itself going to be the way to approach the potential reform. You need more ingredients. And if you start by complying and then keep saying you are a revolutionary, there is an error there somewhere. That's how I feel about it. So NFT, great, just don't sell it as a revolution. Sell it as uh, we are fixing uh, the way that dealers are talking to collectors. Fine. I have no problem. My, I have a gallerist in New York. I'm uh, one of those people that have gallerists, you know. <laughs> and uh, he sells my shit as NFTs. And I said, cool, you're solving your problem, not my problem. My problem is over with, you know, I've done my piece 30 years ago. So if you sell it via lazy printed NFT, I'm, I'm fine. If you find a customer, good for you, man. Give me my share. I have this emotional relationship with money. I, I'm not ashamed of. But I'm not calling this act of, my, of Tamash selling my shit a revolution in the art market or in the art as such or in power relations in the world. Yeah, what time is it? Okay, I think um, maybe I have time for, for an, another uh, remark that's actually uh, coming from uh, uh, Martin's presentation in the previous uh, um, talk. Uh, because he said something uh, uh, like uh, um, all NFT collectors are investors, no? and uh, uh, you said it uh, uh, as a statement, quite uh, not... not uh, uh, which was not requiring any uh, discussion, but uh, I, I would like to discuss it a little bit no? and to add uh, a question mark at the end, because I think that, um, um, for example, uh, um, uh, if, um, um, yeah, uh, there are, um, I think, uh, uh, collectors in this uh, uh, sphere that uh, were just uh, intrigued by the fact that the NFT uh, makes uh, the digital art uh, uh, collectible and uh, just want to uh, own uh, a piece of art, like maybe the collectors uh, who, who want to um, uh, buy a work by Vuk from the gallery. It's not uh, investment, but it's uh, investment for those uh, um, for which uh, uh, the asset is a link to the token and not the other way uh, around. No? Uh, it's an investment for those uh, uh, who uh, think that buying uh, that uh, artwork in that specific uh, uh, moment uh, will uh, uh, give them uh, uh, um, an abstract uh, link to it that can be immediately uh, resolved to somebody uh, else. Uh, no? The uh, collecting bot is not uh, 
buying uh, an artwork. He's buying uh, uh, the NFT, which is connected to a, an artwork that may be valuable, maybe not, uh, and in that case, uh, it will stay unsold. No? Uh, so I, I just wanted to open up the conversation about, uh, um, about uh, this, uh, what uh, uh, collectors uh, desire in this uh, uh, field, uh, no? uh, the ownership of the token or the ownership of the art. I personally have been uh, uh, an avid downloader of uh, everything that artists made for a long, uh, long time. Uh, in recent months, uh, I started to buy a few uh, things, uh, very low level, just in order to support... Uh, no, you, you are too expensive for, <laughs> for me. <laughs> You are too expensive, but uh, yeah, uh, cheap things uh, that can be uh, bought and can support a little bit the, 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 the artist, an artist that they like and so on. I do it, and I, I think that many people are doing the same, no? I don't know if you want to contribute to, to this in some way. Well, that's, that's what I do. I mean, I'm a lot like you. I'm just uh, feeling like I'm contributing to something, I'm supporting an artist, I'm showing them that uh, even if it's a... a doesn't have a very high price. They're not earning uh, maybe a ton of money off my one purchase. It's uh, it's showing my support uh, in some way or another, um, and they've set the price, so they decide. So it's and they've made it accessible. And people are. I think there's a whole range of engagement with it. It's not black and white. It's not that there's people looking to get rich and then there's people who hate NFTs. There's a whole massive middle. I think of people just collecting for pleasure, for fun, um, following the dialogue, just interested intellectually where it will go. And yeah, following your, uh, your segue, uh, as there is no middle in defining a collector, um, I think that the problem, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's not a problem as well. It starts with uh, what is an NFT actually, an NFT is an ERC721 token. That's a class of token that's non-fungible. An NFT can be art, and we're here we're thinking of NFTs in the uh, strict sense of art, but an NFT can also act as a property title, for example. Um, an NFT is also a complicated, finan complex financial instrument. NFTs are versatile assets, so when we're thinking of them, we have to think that the lack of clarity around, you know, this piece of technology has brought us to associate them with art, but also, you know, with a highly financialized and accelerated art. And it's, you know, it's, it's just a different beast, you know, which I'm not saying like it's, it's not good or bad or anything. It's just a different thing. Yeah, you're right. uh, Domenico, I wanted to ask you, I remember participating in a show in Belgium, in Imal, you recall, you were the curator. It was a show of net art from personal collections. There, there was quite an intimate, this was the first time I ever met a person who bought my piece of shit. And uh, it's, it was interesting. I have respect for people who, you know, curators and critics, and they tell me my, my, my stuff is cool, and I'm like, oh yeah, you like it, how cool. But then when somebody votes with their wallet, as they say, when somebody pays money for your piece and actually keeps it, it's not a speculative thing, then you say, oh, whoa, well, I, I read this as an as a extra layer of respect and I find uh, great comfort in uh, being a receiver of their money. Fine. But did you talk to those collectors back then and could you maybe speculate what would, what would be their reaction? You remember that Belgian dentist uh, and other people? Uh, <laughs> that was a fun show. Um, anyway, what do you think about that? What do uh, old uh, new media collectors from 10, 15, 20 years ago, how do they feel about the new generation of collectors or it's all just a line going up again, the video? Yeah, I, I think that you, you can't uh, broadly speak about a new generation of uh, collectors. I mean, uh, there is a new tool that maybe uh, can the uh, outer world that you are the owner of that uh, p digital or physical piece uh, of, uh, of art. Uh, some uh, uh, have accepted it uh, uh, unquestionably. Uh, so some others have uh, concerns uh, and it's fine. Uh, 
Um, but uh, uh, among the people that are buying uh, uh, through this new tool, uh, I think uh, uh, there are people that are doing it uh, uh, for, uh, out of uh, a desire of belonging. Uh, one interesting thing that is uh, happening with some NFTs uh, pro projects, and I completely agree with um, uh, Martin, is that you, you feel to belong to a, a community that is shaping around uh, the project. Uh, some others uh, uh, that are doing it for speculation uh, and they probably care much more uh, about, uh, again, uh, the NFT than not uh, the uh, artwork. Uh, it happens uh, if you go to an exhibition or an auction and you see uh, how collectors behave with, uh, with art artworks. No? You can immediately see uh, the artist selling out uh, um, no, uh, immediately, which is uh, uh, probably perceived by uh, the collectors as an investment. Uh, and the other ones who are selling uh, one, three, two pieces uh, very uh, slowly, which are usually to me the more uh, interesting. Um, so, um, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I think, uh, oh, oh, of course, uh, uh, those uh, uh, collectors, I also know that uh, uh, some of them are very critical about uh, this kind of, uh, um, of market, uh, as they have been uh, about flipping, uh, which happened uh, also before uh, crypto and interested many uh, post-internet artists uh, like Jonas Lund or uh, Petra Kortreit for a bit of uh, time. No? Uh, so, uh, I, I think we probably have to uh, separate uh, these uh, two uh, conversations about uh, uh, speculation and about uh, uh, collecting. No? It will be a way to restructure a little bit the conversation around the NFTs. But we are stealing the time to the audience question. I, I don't have any question on the screen, so <laughs> please. One, two, three. Hello. Um, yeah, if I can ask a question. Um, I would like to reference some words which are on this huge slide and also some words which was uh, mentioned in the debate. So long-term commons and uh, supporting the artist. Question is very simple. Can you maybe compare NFTs to some of the other um, art support platforms which are maybe a bit more common in the commons side of, uh, of the art uh, scene, like uh, Libera Pay or Patreon? That's a question. Mm -hmm. Maybe Maria Paola, won't you say something about this? Absolutely. I mean, buying an NFT, uh, it, it, you know, as I said, you know, NFTs are versatile. Some people like the sphere, which I uh, introduced in my presentation, are talking about not selling, you know, a JPEG with, a, with an image, but I'll, are talking about uh, selling a JPEG with an NFT, but I'll t uh, but are talking about selling um, like an NFT that grants patronage rights and the investment on the, perfor the future performances and uh, you know that's a form of patronage. There's a, another platform channel started by uh, podcasters um, that has created their own Patreon in their own uh, with their own set of rules. So I see uh, you know a lot of trends around patronage and NFTs, and you know they just make it easier for people because you just press a transaction and that's it. Um, maybe it's complicated from the tax perspective where you want to deduct your patronage from taxes, and that's a di but that's a different story, and I'm not a tax attorney. Other questions? First, very briefly, I know that uh, that's not allowed, but a comment instead of a question. Um, you, you, you paraphrased me with um, what I said earlier about... Um, um, collectors and investors, and, and that itself, what I said, was actually a very poorly paraphrased idea for the, from a talk that um, um, Kelani Nicole gave, and, and she was talking about um, artists being 
I think the way she put it was like artists, NFT artists work for the industry, for the art industry. They, they, they work to produce commissions for the platforms. They work to enable the profits from flipping from, for collectors. So there's another layer to this, in other words. Um, anyways, that's the, that's the comment. Um, my question is about uh, NFTs as a long-term artistic medium. And I thought it was a very interesting thread running through all of your presentations of net art and the kind of politicized um, um, ideals we oftentimes associate with net art. But what about NFTs as an even much longer term artistic medium? I'm, I'm very interested in early histories of computer art. I personally am a great fan of generative art and, 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 and so really yeah. earlier um, computer art histories. So this is a media art history question. Um, because I don't know, I'm, so there is this, is, is there not a kind of renaissance of interest in generative art and computer art and the history of computer art that expresses itself so powerfully in this uh, NFT art um, um, universe um, and, uh, you know, with a lot of generative artists in the NFT space kind of claiming that history as their part of their legacy. And I think that's really genuine on some level, and they, but also I think those kids, as you would call them, are just discovering this history in some ways. Um, it also has, in amazing ways, brought popularity to um, some, you know, OG OGs of computer art, like Herbert W. Franke, before he passed away then. But still, I don't know what's going on there. Is, to me, it seems also that, uh, I'd like to hear your, your opinions about, about this increased interest and, 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 and return to this history of computer art, because I'm also somehow suspecting that this has something to do with the way in which generative art, serialization, iterative art approaches are somehow aligned to ways in which you can really monetize NFTs really, really well uh, right now. So it's a bit of a maybe not so genuine after all, uh, the, 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 that claim to a legacy of computer art. So I'm, I'm curious if you can move your, you know, think back past net art to earlier histories of computer art in, in, in uh, some kind of trajectory. Anybody wants? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd like to play with that. Uh, I was also saddened to hear that Ken Knowlton died recently, and I was a big fan of his work. He was even more... Uh, fundamentally important to me. Uh, the trick is uh, uh, each generation of avant-gardists dream become next generation's infrastructure. So when you say generative art from the mid-60s uh, that is so impressive uh, uh, and I'm super proud that in my country Yugoslavia we had the first uh, uh, exhibition of computer art ever four days before serendipity in ICA. They, those jerks stole the thunder and Umberto Eco was one of the curators here, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, yes, I'm an archaeologist by training. That's my formal education. So I have a tendency, maybe not uh, every early net artist had the same reflex. But I did my homework. And only much, much later, schools came around where you can actually learn about this shit. I'm, uh, I'm noticing that uh, uh, that is the first thing that's not happening, uh, education. I have to say that because I can see my friend there who is running a new media department at the local art school and he's doing that job well. Um, second thing, yes, uh, these grand methodological inventions such as generative art cease to have historic or artistic relevance per se and become just a basic tool in a toolbox and it, it just so happens that they align, like you said, perfectly with what is needed nowadays to have the NFT engine running. Uh, and it's without any, uh, as uh, uh, another dead French man, uh, uh, Breton, uh, once said, like, it's without aesthetical or moral preoccupation. It's like just there to be used, so use it. It without any thinking. Sadly. I think it will be nice to go on, but uh, uh, it's quite late, no? It's, are, um, are we get, no, it's okay for you to get uh, uh, yeah. some more questions. 
I'm just expressing my frustration with this talk that is super narrowly focusing on digital art NFTs. NFTs has over 50 discovered use cases as a piece of technology. It's even more important than the tokens themselves. So to, to label them as non-long-term artistic mediums is, I think, it's a bit uh, uh, ultra uh, boomer. Because might be the future of art is something that we create governance structures where we use these pieces of technology, where we create multifaceted art, which result in some digital art. I hate, digit I hate the monkeys. I don't like those guys, you know. I'm not for the monkeys, right? I'm for broadening the scope of our talk because NFTs are non-fungible tokens, unique digital identifiers living on the blockchain forever. So why don't we think about them as more broad tools of what we could incorporate into unique digital identifiers as instead of labeling them as like uh, stupid monkeys. Thank you. Yeah, I also just have a, two comments. One uh, was the immediate reaction to your previous conversation about the investments and thank you so much for the explanation. I would advocate, and this is not a legal advice, but we should probably be avoiding um, any terms like investments or investors especially when we're talking about collectors, we would do ourselves a favor. For sure, regulators are going to be looking into that and thinking about the NFTs that these are, in fact, invest investors and investments, and these are securities, and we're already dealing with these types of issues. So probably we're going to really do ourselves a favor if we're not going to be putting everything in the same basket. And the second thing, you already shed some light onto it already, um, but the way I see it is almost like uh, going back in time where we had this verbal medium where people were providing stories and they were uh, composing poems, let's say, but they weren't actually having the written medium. It's almost like, to me, it almost feels like we're in that specific time zone when we would have um, people perceiving poems and verbal mediums as art, but they would already be thinking about the written mediums and be talking about how written mediums are also going to be art but they wouldn't have the written medium just yet because nobody would read and write at that time. And right now we're talking about something that is composed of NFTs and when you look at the code, the code sometimes really is artistic, but we don't know the language. Like you talk to the coders, you talk to developers, but I don't understand what they're actually composing. But sometimes if you are a developer, if you are a coder, it looks like art to them. And I kind of have a feeling that, you know, these technology is not all like gener generative art and computer art that might be happening in 1960s, but literally we, don't, we didn't have computers 30 years ago. So we're really dealing with something that is very, very novel, and we might be thinking and talking about something that might resemble art in the future, but right now, at least that's my personal opinion, we're talking about something that we're not even able to grasp entirely, like in its, in its sense, what it actually presents. So it's a medium, but we're not there yet. We, it's really hard for us to actually think of it as an art medium. I'm just wondering if this is also your perception that we are a bit early in time. And like I really like the comment that Vuk made previously. We need more education in a sense. Um, but I was just wondering if this is also your sense that we are a bit ahead of our time. It's already gone. I think we're ahead of our time to, uh, in classifying um, we're not ahead of our time in discussing the ramifications of NFTs, but definitely in classifying and, you know, like the whole like campaign that has, you know, the whole f infighting between uh, pro-NFT, this is life-changing technology, but actually money, not technology, and uh, the people saying, no, this is hyper-capitalization. All of that is like, there are very important questions and very important arguments that we need to have very early on. Otherwise, we uh, risk, again, um, you know, just uh, being captured by technology. And yeah, we're, we're all discussing around a bunch of code that didn't do anything to us, you know. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's early and it's late. It's, it's everything in, in between too. It's a period of discovery, right? And, yeah. and I think we're also, there are some really interesting cases that maybe didn't get discussed, but you know, like what you can do with smart contracts, like, so um, Memo Acton, an uh, artist who is active in the scene, uh, posted to Twitter saying, 
hey, wow, um, I had this random micropayment in my wallet and I had no idea what it was. And it turned out that someone, an academic wrote a paper and cited me and made the paper into an NFT and everyone gets micropayments whenever, you know, I mean, simple stuff, like really simple, but actually um, just so, so the antithesis of how we think of buying and selling and sharing, um, you know, sharing value with each other, it's, it's just uh, elegant, you know? And we're in this period of discovering all of these applications, and I think that's really interesting. I don't know why, but when you ask your question, the only words that came to my mind were reality capitalism, and I'm really having fun with myself right now, putting meaning inside those words. Thank you very much. Uh, Domenico, I, I, think, just, yeah. Domenico, I just have one comment to book. No, 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 no. It's just like, I cannot let it stand that you put Duran Duran in a negative context. So <laughs> I'm very sorry, you know, as a pro Durani, I just have to put, you know, my foot down. It's That's generational, <laughs> it's generational. You're not really older than me, so yeah, <laughs> that was just my comment, thank you. I definitely think that uh, we should uh, uh, develop again this conversation outside of this room. Now it's really time to um, give the word back to Axioma for the final remarks. Yanes? Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Is this uh, working? <laughs> thanks, Domenico. Uh, before proceeding um, with the final thanks, um, I would like to point out once again that Domenico Quaranta is actually the curator of the Byzantine uh, General's Problems, the group exhibition that uh, we have included in the program. And that is also part of Distant Gallery, a sustainable art initiative connecting cultural actors from different parts of the world and different parts of the art world. Distant Gallery runs on Common Gardens, an online artist-run platform uh, initiated by Constant Dulard. I warmly invite you to go uh, checking the exhibition if you didn't do so in so far. Uh, so this panel marks uh, the end of the 13th edition of Tactics and Practice, the conference series that Axioma, Institute for Contemporary Art Ljubljana, holds every year here in Ljubljana in collaboration uh, with Kino Shishka. And this edition has been realized in the framework of CONS platform for contemporary investigative art and with the precious contribution of two of its partners, namely Local Patriot and Lyudmila. For its realization, I would like to thank uh, Felix Tardes, Shuli Chang, and Rock Rantz for joining me on the curatorial board, Marcela Okretic for uh, guiding the production process, Sonia Gardina for promotion, Walter Udovicic for technical coordination, Jan Marin and Fix Media team for live streaming, Federico Antonini for uh, visual identity, Domen Dimowski and Gaspar Torkar for the animated graphics, and Igor Kovacic for the website. And of course, a big and a huge uh, thanks goes also to the entire uh, crew of Kino Shishka and uh, to all our outreach uh, partners, Fair Data Society, We Are Millions, Nero from Rome and Makery from Paris. And last but not least, thanks to all the speakers, the moderators, online and in real life audience, and to all the people who believe in the relevance and need to talk about these topics and have encouraged us and support us to do so. So, <laughs> dear friends, uh, this edition of Tactics and Practice is uh, over. See you next time, I guess, in March 2023. That's all greetings from Ljubljana to the online audience. Nasvidenia.
Thank you.